The following production is part of the Play Some Video Games podcast network. Borders and welcome to Board with Video Games, the gaming podcast that strives for the right balance of coverage for games you play on your table and on your television. You can think of us as the Lilo and Stitch of gaming podcasts. We're a proud member of the PSVG Podcast Network. I am one of your hosts, Kyle, and joining me on this co-op adventure, the guy who ensures I do not get left behind. Josh, how are you doing? I am doing great. Are we embracing borders? Is that what we're doing? Well, I thought I tried it on for size. What do you think? I mean, it used to be a bookstore, and obviously it's no, spelled it, differently. It but... makes me think of someone who went out of business. <laughs> <laughs> well, spelled differently, that makes it okay, doesn't it? Uh-huh. That's true. I wouldn't argue with that. So hearing it said, like, how do you feel about borders? I think it's dangerously close to hoarders, so it could have a <laughs> negative connotation. Uh, I mean, it might be kind of accurate, too, though. But we could also take, take yeah, we could make it a positive one. Right. I don't I didn't hate it. Okay. That is like the 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 faintest praise ever. I didn't hate it. <laughs> didn't hate it. It's not terrible. I also got did I get am I Lilo or am I a stitch in that? Because I think they're both leading each other from trouble. Right. In this category, isn't Lilo the one who tells Stitch that like Ohana means family and family means like no yes. one's left behind? So like so you would be Lilo and I would be Stitch. And sometimes it feels like we're speaking different languages. I mean, sometimes that is true. I feel like that is. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. I'm a are big you, Disney are, guy. Are you a fan of Lilo and Stitch? Yes. Uh, like although it's, it's been a while since I've seen it. It's been a while since I've seen it as well. I feel like it's a very underappreciated Disney film. My cousin is the biggest Stitch fan that I've ever heard of. He's insane with Stitch. Everything. Uh, I can't. I don't want to get into it because I'll make him sound like a crazy person. <laughs> but <laughs> Okay. He's infatuated with Stitch, so he's a huge fan. Is there something specific about Stitch that he is infatuated with? I don't know, but I do remember, maybe you remember when, for our older uh, listeners, when Lilo and Stitch came out, the Mm -hmm. ad campaign before the movie was, uh, the trailer would be a different Disney movie and Stitch would like inexplicably be in the movie. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or like Aladdin's on the magic carpet and he's on it with him or he's, you know, with Ariel underwater, all these different things. And they would like put him into every Disney movie. So I think that might be where like the interest in the character started. I, I'm going to say he likes the character more than the film. Okay. Um, so he's not as into the Stitch cinematic universe, maybe? As- it, it's just a guess. I have. I guess I should say I've never sat down and had a conversation with him about his love for Lilo and Stitch. <laughs> so who knows? Um, I just I don't remember too much about the movie. I remember there's like other aliens trying to catch him, mm-hmm. and he's an experiment number something, which I can never remember. I should watch it again. Watch it. And, and it has Mr. Has Mr. Like Bubbles? Is it that the? Oh, he's the big man yeah. black looking dude. Yeah. yeah, isn't he Mr. Bubbles? Yeah, maybe I'll I watch it so. with the kiddo and see if the kid isn't scared to death of it. <laughs> right now, I he's did. only scared of vacuums, so maybe we can handle Lilo and Stitch. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, I was just about to compare your kid to my dogs. So I yeah, it's, yeah do I do. I did compare him to the cat, so it's so, the same thing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think Lilo and Stitch was one of those. I didn't see it in the theaters or anything when it first came out. I saw Lilo and Stitch many years later. And then mm. I appreciated it quite a bit. I thought it was pretty wonderful because it has some really good messages, some good lines in it, you know? I don't know. I just, I enjoy Lilo and Stitch. I think it is very underappreciated. Like when you talk about like the Disney pantheon of like their animation of the late eighties and nineties, you know, you talk about Aladdin and the Lion King and Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast. Like those are all great, but I think Lilo and Stitch gets a short shrift in those conversations. Well, I look forward to our Disney podcast when we get to alphabetically Leo and Stitch and we can go full on. So here's the question. If we did a Disney podcast. Yeah, I would do would that. It, would it be <laughs> non-animated movies as well? 
<laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, are we doing pirates? We could do it. Doing... We could do it non non animated as well. And what start year are we a? starting? Oh, we're going to do it alphabetically. That's what I would do. You start from A. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll talk about that. Maybe that'll be part Record of it. right after this. Yeah. <laughs> just exactly. Jump right into it. <laughs> It'll just be our chance to get another podcast going. You know. So, yeah, hey, more podcasts. That's what this world needs. I read somewhere, and I don't remember who originally said it, and I thought it was kind of true that like be- doing a podcast today is like being in a band in the nineties. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> a, yeah. You're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah, which I think is totally funny and true, and I've totally done both things because I'm old. But anyway, <laughs> on to the <laughs> housekeeping. This is not a Disney podcast yet. This is a gaming podcast. So thanks so much for joining us this week. As always, if you have any feedback, questions, suggested topics, hit us up at Board with VG on Twitter, or check out all the wonderfully awesome things Josh is posting over on the Instagram, also Board with VG. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Board with VG. So we love five-star ratings over there. And if you want to communicate in the long form or enter a contest I'll talk about soon, boardwithvg at gmail.com. We love when you use hashtag Board with VG on all the social medias, no matter what you're doing, just to kind of See what the community is up to, what games they're playing, and what they're just doing in their regular lives. And, of course, whatever podcast service you listen to us on, we encourage you to give us a stellar rating. That's whether you're downloading us from the PSVG feed or the standalone board with video games feed. PSVG has launched a Patreon, and we're thrilled with the support you have given us thus far. If you'd like to monetarily support what we do, you can find us at patreon.com slash PSVG. But the most important thing is just that you listen and maybe share us with someone who might enjoy the things that we do. But I do want to give a quick shout out to our Patreon producers, Coach Hulk, Edwin Kahlo, Devin Tyus, Kevin Austin, Chris M., Joel Voss, Professor Switch himself, and Bonesaw. Thank you so much for your support at that producer level. Speaking of Patreon... The Patreon giveaway this month is sponsored by Board with Video Games. So if you become a patron by January 22nd, I think at any level, you will have the chance to win a copy of the board game Santorini. I will be doing that drawing on January 22nd. So just make sure that you have registered and become a patron uh, by that January 22nd date. And I will do the drawing that day before we record our show that will be publishing on January 24th. So if you'd like to win a copy of Santorini, feel free to become a patron. Also, the Metaspring Contest is going on. We have a lot of updates this week. Oh, howdy. The Metaspring Contest is currently going on, and we would love for you to enter. How do you enter the Metaspring Contest, you might ask? Simple. All you need to do is send an email to boardwithvg at gmail.com with your prediction as to what the following list of games will score on metacritic when they release the games you need to provide scores for are resident evil 2 kingdom hearts 3 crackdown 3 metro exodus far cry new dawn anthem devil may cry 5 the division 2 mortal Kombat 11 days gone and yoshi's crafted world so provide your prediction for what each of those games is going to score on metacritic Send it to boardwithvg at gmail.com by midnight Eastern on January 18th, and you will be entered to win a wonderful prize, which obviously won't happen until after Days Gone releases on April 26th, because we got to get those Metacritic scores for all of these games. There are full details on psvg.blog. Also, if you go to our pinned tweet on Twitter, you can find out through all of the rules there. But just remember, by midnight Eastern, January 18th, send us that email. And finally, Board with Video Games is hosting a game night with the Xbox Empire on Saturday, January 26th from 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. Central Time. We're going to be playing some good old Halo 5. And if you don't currently own Halo 5, it is on Game Pass. So if you've never had Game Pass, you can sign up for a seven-day free trial or your first month is just $1 currently. But if you already have Game Pass, you have the game. So again, Saturday, January 26th from 7 p.m. to 11 p.m., Board with Video Games and the Xbox Empire are getting together to play some Halo 5. We would absolutely love for you to join us. Whew, Josh, that was a ton of housekeeping, man. Mm-hmm. We're doing stuff, though. Going. I know yes. we're doing stuff, which is pretty exciting. I'm glad that we're doing stuff. And we really hope that you all, wonderful listeners, want to participate in all those great things. 
So with that, we're going to probably do things a bit different this week. We are just going to talk about news and answer some listener questions instead of having a topic of the show because, you know, the end of 2018 was a little slow, but boy, did 2019 start with a roar. So we have a lot of things we haven't talked about that we want to cover. So with that, Josh, what has been some of the hot board game news, sir? Well, <clears throat> let's start with, I would, get, I would say... This is considered a surprise announcement. But at least it was to me. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'll just read it a little bit, and then we'll talk about uh, Fantasy Flight Games announces Journeys in Middle Earth. Um, so I'll read their press announcement a little bit. They've announced a new board game based on Tales from the Lord of the Rings called Journeys in Middle Earth. It's a fully cooperative, app-supported board game for one to five players. <clears throat> Players take on the roles of Middle Earth's heroes, such as Gimli the Dwarf and Frodo the Hobbit, as they embark across Middle Earth on grand adventures and fights against Sauron's oppression. Individual games, uh, which last roughly an hour, serve as standalone adventures in an overarching campaign across the wilderness. Players use from six different heroes who have their own abilities and use special skills instead of dice. While exploring, Encountering threats, attacking enemies, and interacting with the people of Middle-earth, in addition to hero-specific skill cards, there are also role-specific cards which can be added to the deck. <clears throat> so if Frodo takes on the role of a Pathfinder in one adventure, he can take on the role of a Hunter in another adventure and play differently because the cards will be different in his deck. Um, there's 25 miniatures. There's a bunch of bad guys. There's going to be uh, branching narratives and side quests. It's interesting to look at. If you want to check it out, on you can go to Dice Tower News or go to Fantasy Flight's uh, website. I'll tell you, Kyle, um, I was intrigued by it at first. I saw on Fantasy Flight's site, if you pre-ordered it, um, you would get um, like special, you get character mats for every character. They already sold out of those. I know, like two and a half days. Just crazy. Yeah. Uh, and I say that's crazy because the game is $100. Yep. And that's not just it because there's also like a supplemental map that's $50 if you want to get it with the game. I think it's, isn't it 40? Oh, 40. Sorry, 49. Is it? I think it's 39.95. Uh, is it 39? Okay, mm -hmm. so $40. Still, $40 for an additional map. Um, so I think we have some questions from listeners later that kind of reference my worry about this, just like mansions of madness. Second edition is these games that are going to be relying on apps mm -hmm. and the cost. Uh, we're already seeing people talking about dead apps for things. Right. And how it kind of makes like renders some games like unusable. Mm hmm. Um, what's your opinion on that? And what do you think about this game from what you've seen so far? So I'll talk about the game first. And I'm really interested in this game. I was going to actually pre-order it today. But by the time I went to pre-order, they had the announcement up that, hey, you no longer get the special play mats if you pre-order because we're out of them. And it literally, like, I think the article posted about the game on January 13th. And by January 15th, 15th at 11 30 a.m they were already out of them which probably says that it pre-ordered pretty well right like that's pretty awesome for them i guess yeah, for sure and it's shipping q2 2019 so it's coming out pretty soon i mean you'll have it by you know june. end of june at the latest theoretically so that's pretty awesome i am a casual lord of the rings fan my yeah. wife though is a huge lord of the rings fan adores lord of the rings like regularly I can't even count the number of times she's watched the movies. I can't count the number of times she's read the books. I will do trivia things like randomly I'll come across like super hard Lord of the Rings trivia thing. And I will ask her the questions and she will get, you know, 90% of them right. Wow. She is super into Lord of the Rings. So I showed this to her and said, hey, are you interested in this? And of course she said yes. But there's one question that isn't answered that I want to know the answer to. And that's how long is this game? All right. How many missions are there? Like, is it seems like it's app driven. So are the missions only on the app? Right, right. That's it's it certainly seems to lead in that direction. Right. So 
that you know kind of like you said is a a bit worrying i hope that in some ways it's worrying in some ways it's exciting right because they could continue to add missions theoretically for free but i'm sure you have to pay you know like i'm sure like you might get an occasional one for free but i could see them releasing like a mission pack expansion where you don't need to buy any other physical parts or components for the game but it's just a add-on app purchase for 15 bucks that adds like three more or five more or whatever missions to it i am hesitant to pre-order it right now just because i don't know how many missions are in the box for the 100 dollars and her first thing was this seems a lot like pathfinder the adventure card game but just with a board uh yeah i could see that i would be okay with that in that situation i would do because i really like pathfinder i think it's a lot of fun so I'm interested in this. I Yeah, the app is a little bit interesting. And I think it's kind of interesting, too, that there's basically two types of boards, basically, it looks yeah. like. That you have kind of like the adventuring boards, and then you have like the, the battle boards, basically, if you're having like a war. So, yeah, and there's a lot of minis, which is cool. I like Lord of the Rings, like I said, so it's cool. Like, I'm super interested in this. Fantasy Flight overall does really good stuff. So I I think I want to get this. I just wish I knew how many darn missions there were. Yeah, it's interesting that they, they, you know, I mean, obviously the fan base of Lord of the Rings is what's probably, like, propelling the pre-orders. But all your questions are probably questions these people pre-ordering the game should be asking. (laughs) Right. I mean, no. so you, did you did you not pre-order then? No, no. Uh, I I like Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. This is a game that um, I would probably end up not playing that often or trying to play by myself. Gotcha. Like, if I was really into Lord of the Rings, I would have bought the Barnes and Noble exclusive one that they still have. Mm-hmm. That came out at Gen Con, mm-hmm. uh, which I still might get. Um, I, but I'll be hundred percent honest with you. Like, I look at this picture of the map mm-hmm. of the board it doesn't look that good to me it kind of looks low quality and it could just be the picture but like a hundred dollars to me it just doesn't like scream that at me especially with the app like built in i'm trying to be a little bit more cautious about that and i don't know that i have any games right now that rely on apps i was going to get rising five and i kind of held off on that because mm. it's app driven Mm-hmm. Just a little worried. I'm like Rising Five is like thirty bucks, so I think that's a little bit more feasible. Right. Um, but I have man- I bought Mansions of Madness First Edition because mm-hmm. I don't need the app. So you and bought that over Second Edition when you had the chance to buy Second Edition when I had the opportunity. I mean, I obviously got it at a much cheaper price as well. Right. But I would love to play Second Edition on an app. But I'm worried. Um, I'm just worried about the app thing. Right. Could be unwarranted. Who knows? But. That's just something that holds me back from if this game was 60 bucks. Yeah, I'd probably buy it. Right. I just wish that I had, could like look at the rule book or something. Yeah, I know. Maybe like, there, um, Plat Hat's really good about that. Maybe there isn't one. Maybe it's all in the <laughs> app. <laughs> that would be a problem. <laughs> I think games that do these app driven games, they need to support a ma- uh, fully playable game without the app. Like give you a rule book. So, hey. If you don't want to use the app, like there's a game on Kickstarter right now. It's like a game you play in the dark and it's app supported. Um, it's like a hunting game. I forget mm-hmm. the name of it. It's a ghost like game. Um, it's under bucks, but, and it's, it looks really cool and you play it in the dark, but there's also a rule book for not using the app and playing it in the, in the light. So you have the choice to do that. Yeah, because Alchemists did that, or Alchemist. I don't remember if there's an S on the end of it, but they did that too, right? Where there was the app that could you could use for the game to make it easier, basically. Sure. But if you didn't want to use the app, you basically get you had to have like a game master, I think, in that scenario where you had someone who was like doing all of the figuring out about like if you combine this and this, like what happens. Um, but that was, I think, then had to be a different role for someone to play. But you could still play it without the app if you wanted to. Yeah, I think that just, I mean, they're popular. I think that's just my hang up um, about the game. So. so is there, do you think, do you think we will get to a point where board games, apps with board games or using an app during a board game is ubiquitous? Or just that's just what happens. Not in every game, but there's enough games out there that do it where it just isn't 
a big deal anymore. I think they're definitely becoming more popular. Um, I really wanted to get the Black Mirror nose dive game, but that's mm-hmm. also app driven, and like the whole game is non functional without the app. Right. Um, so I think just just the way we talk about um, digital cloud based consoles, mm-hmm. I think we have the same issue with board games. Like board games, people know as a physical medium, like right. media. Like I, I like board games because I can touch them, I can interact with them, and I know I'll always have them. Gotcha. And I think the more that they go digital, the more uh, I don't know. Uh, people are embracing it, so yeah, I think it's going to become a thing where it's way more common than it is now. I mean, you're kind of being a bit of a hypocrite because there is one app-driven game that you can't play without the app that you do enjoy. What What am I forgetting? Drop Mix. Oh, yeah. You know what? <laughs> you're absolutely right. But also not exactly the same thing. It's kind of like a hybrid game. Yeah, like not a, exactly the same thing. Right. When it came out, we like had this whole thing. Like, is it a board game? Because right. like it's it's so different. So, yeah, you're right. It is a little, I am a little hypocritical on that, but I it's only a because different. only because I don't necessarily associate drop mix with the board game, even though it's in here with my board game. So, right. um, uh, yeah. So maybe if more games are like drop mix, <laughs> 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 no, I, I mean, it, it, we'll see where it goes. I'm, I'm, I think I'm excited to learn more about it. I, guess I am would too. Be what I would say. Okay. Let's move on to the big empire in the room, the Asmodee empire. So Asmodee announced they uh, are acquiring Bezer Wizard Nordic. Um, if you haven't heard of Bezer Wizard, you're not alone. Um, they're a small, uh, let's say, party game company. They do yeah, I think that's appropriate. party games, award games, um, but they're they're popular in the board game industry. Like people in the industry know them because they these are party games that board gamers play that aren't just like the people who buy the smart ass game at Walmart. Cause it has a picture of a donkey on it. Like these are a little bit more highly rated. Um, and most of them, uh, most of their games haven't come out in the U S <clears throat> sorry. There's a few that have come out that have been translated to English, but that's not the case being Nordic. They are in the Nordic countries. Um, so I'll read <clears throat> a statement from, them. We are excited and proud to become part of Asmodee. Having built a strong Nordic position in trivia and party games, we are ready to bring our games to players in other parts of the world. As a member of the Asmodee family, who shares our dedication to high-quality board games, said Jesper Bilo, Bezer Wizard Nordic CEO. Uh, so it's Asmodee's 14th studio uh, and brings its expertise in developing successful trivia games, with creative developing and marketing teams to the group. Um, Asmodee is in 18 countries now, and they have 14 publishing studios. So what do you think? Is this big news? Is this just is this exciting news? Is this just news to report news because everyone's waiting on the next Asmodee acquisition? What do you think? So here's my question for you really quick. Yeah. How much do you think? So Bezer Wizard actually one of those companies who's named after like their first big game, Bezer Wizard. Yeah. How much do you think that game is currently on Amazon? Oh, geez. Well, it's not in, it's not in, it's, it's going to be okay. So there's this game called Insider. I have on my Amazon wish list. Mm-hmm. I've, I've been told it's the best party game that has ever been released. And it's a Japanese game, but it has English rules. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to get it after I heard Dice Tower talk about it. It was like 25 bucks on Amazon. And then I went out of print. And then it was $287 on Amazon for like six months. <laughs> and then it was back for 25 bucks. And now it's not available again. So I'm assuming Bezer Wizard is probably similar to Insider, if I had to guess. Well, I believe this was published by Mattel in the US. Oh, it was published in the US. I, by, I think by Mattel. It's not the identical version to the European version, um, but I believe Mattel published a US version of the game that was had like fewer questions and things like that in it. All right. Well, if it's in print, I'm going to guess 20 bucks. If it's out of print, I'm going to guess some crazy person selling it for like 197 bucks. Not quite $197. It is 85 bucks right now. Plus, okay. 
plus 10 bucks for shipping <laughs> for a game with a whole bunch of cards that ask questions, basically. Yeah, you could just go to like so. your local consignment shop and find Trivial Pursuit cards and get those instead. <laughs> right. So I do think this is an interesting acquisition, mainly because I want to know why. Why this company, like what what about them was so... What about Bezer Wizard? What could they do? Or what property or IP did they hold that was so important to Asmodee that they didn't think one of their other 13 studios could do it? You know what I'm saying? Right. You know, it could be one of those situations where a brand is popular, very popular in another country and not anywhere else where maybe Asmodee is like, well, we don't have any games selling high in Norway. And their number one publisher is Bezer Wizard. And we could get them for cheap. That's true. You know, that, and then they were like, this is how we get the Nordic countries. I don't know that, that that's what they're thinking, but because because I feel the same way as you, I'm like, it doesn't make a lot of sense for them to to, to snatch up a tiny company. But right. like, when you look at Microsoft buying all these small companies too, like I think it makes about the same amount of sense. Right. And I mean, I know I did a prediction about Asmodee buying another <laughs> company that was going to be like groundbreaking or one that we didn't expect. I mean, I genuinely didn't expect them to buy Bezer Wizard. I think your prediction is still valid for the rest of the year. <laughs> I, like, I, I'm not saying that this counts as my prediction being accurate because I, I don't think I would do that. But like, yeah, I just find this a really interesting acquisition because I, I don't know. And not try, I'm not trying to be disrespectful to the folks at Bezer Wizard, but I just don't know what this brings Asmodee that they didn't already have. Unless, like you said, that they have some reach as far as distribution and connections with some Nordic, you know, either game sellers or marketing or something that Asmodee just feels that they need an inroads with. Because they have, I mean, Bezer Wizard has two big games, you know, Bezer Wizard, which I've said that so many times in the last <laughs> five minutes, and the game Hint, you know. Which I'm but, looking at right now. Yeah. Bezer Wizard rank on Board Game Geek is 2,069. Hint is 7,824. Granted, that doesn't necessarily mean, I mean, I think Board Game Geek very clearly has a slant and an angle, and there's parts of the world that use it more than others. So maybe they are huge in the Nordic countries, and I'm just a dumb American, which is very, very possible. Well, I mean, like, so they have hand rated, right? But they have no designer and no artist listed. Right. And... Uh, yeah. So it's tough when you see things like that. Uh, the weight is one. Correct. That's crazy. It's That's four to ten players. So pretty low. <laughs> maybe they're looking at game. Maybe they're looking at the success of Pandasaurus with like the mind and the game. Like, and then they don't have something like that. Maybe they say like, we need us. Uh, like clearly, the casual gaming audience is walking into Barnes and Noble and Target and buying. 10 and $20 party games. That's very true. That's very and true. They don't have that. So maybe and, that's what they're thinking. Right. And maybe that they presented them with prototypes and demos of things that they're working on that are going to be ready to go soon. And they're right. like, these are great. Yeah. I really, <laughs> I like the fact that we can just like hypothesize about stuff that we have no inside information about. I have no clue about. <laughs> it's fun. Everyone enjoys it. It's great. Hey, well, someone has to do it. Someone's That's doing right. it somewhere. Why not us? Yes, but I will say <laughs> I don't count this as the Asmodee acquisition. I still think something bigger is coming. Maybe, yeah, I don't know what it's going to be, but I think there's going to be a big, big acquisition for them. Yeah, I, I, I'm i sure there will be. Um, Maybe it's going to be bored with video games. Maybe they're going to buy us out from PSVG. We're lower than Bezer Wizard on the acquisition. <laughs> list. So that would not count as... They wouldn't big... even do a press release about it. No, because they no. Well, it would get us. People would visit us more if there was a press release. Let's just make one. I'll steal Asmodee's font and just apologize later. Asmodee <laughs> let's, let's, acquires let's, board with the video games. Let's not. Let's not do that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's move on to some more board game news. We have uh, Michael Stackpole resigns from the Gamma Board of Directors uh, in a controversial piece of board gaming news. Michael Stackpole has resigned from the Gamma Board of Directors after many decades of service. Michael Stackpole is an Origins award-winning designer, a video game writer and designer, fantasy author, and has been a vocal and active advocate on the side of board gaming for 30-plus years. Uh, in a letter of resignation, he made 
uh, public, Stackpole states, I have, quote, uh, I have not reached the decision based on any political divide within the board. I have come to it because the board is broken, end quote. And savage quote. <laughs> he further goes on to cite recent problems within Gamma, including ineffectiveness to pass decisions, the mismanagement of highly publicized, of a highly publicized altercation between an officer and a security guard during Gen Con. Uh, and he also released his uh, resignation letter. I won't read it um, here because it's lengthy, but you can find it. Uh, at his website, stormwolf.com, or you can go to Dice Tower News to find it. Um, but essentially, he goes into some behind-the-scenes info and even uh, talks about an email uh, sent about him that actually accidentally got sent to him, uh, which I'm sure a lot of people in businesses can relate to. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Kyle, you know you knew more about this than I, so why don't you give our listeners a little bit of insight onto um uh if and what this means for the board gaming industry absolutely if, and what this means if this <laughs> if, means anything right for the board in the game industry and what that might be <laughs> so just to your credit where credit is due the part that josh was reading there was, was from dice tower news so go ahead yes. he can head over there read the story that they wrote up that's what josh was reading about if you're not familiar gamma is basically i don't necessarily want to say it's like i was going to try to associate it i was going to say it's like the e3 of video games but that's not the appropriate it's like the academy for board games i uh, kind of it, yes the golden globes <laughs> uh well golden globes is no it'd be more like the academy because that's people who are part of part who of do the fa- yeah gotcha. who do that stuff but yeah anyway gamma is the game manufacturers association it is the trade organization for those who sell buy provide create develop publish board games it's kind of their trade organization and it's just very interesting because, you know, Michael Stackpole has been around in the game industry for a really long time. He's one of those people whose names has kind of always floated out there. He's someone who is not necessarily like a high profile designer, but he's someone who you regularly come across. And for him to say, like, look, this thing that I've spent 30 plus years in is just not worth it anymore has to be a pretty big flag that something is going on in the gamma board that there's something happening that is not still pushing the industry forward like he intended or thinks that they should um in his letter of resignation that he posts on his website he talks about how you know the board took 45 minutes toward a resolution empowering a committee to hire a lawyer a lawyer to negotiate with another lawyer and you know it's kind of humorous to think because you know i think we've all worked for been in organizations where we sit there and we're just like wow this is not the most functional group right now but clearly he thought the group was so dysfunctional that even from within he felt he could no longer create positive change or push the group in a direction that is helpful or is positive or is working in the best interest of people who are part of gamma and that it was time for him to step away because he literally said the board is broken not that it's having a rough time not that they're making some poor decisions that it just doesn't work anymore so i'll be really interested to see what if any response gamma has at this point i don't believe they have given any response to him leaving or stepping away and this is just i don't want to say troubling but i think it'll be very interesting especially when Origins rolls around coming up here in a few months, that runs actually at the same time as E3. Yeah. It'll be very interested to see how Origins goes, how that is handled, if this has any impact or any questions are asked when it comes to attendance, who is there, membership, all of those things. And if you know this is going to be what Gamma needs to kind of pull themselves out from the muck and say, okay, we're going to start doing things better. Or are they going to come out and say, like, look, this, you know, he's been a great member of our industry, but he's off base and is not totally, you know, what he's characterized is not accurate or correct about how we function and that we're just not worried about what he had to say. I'll be very interested to see kind of what they say. Josh, as someone who, you know, we talk about board games every week, hmm. is this something that worries you at all? Um, Not really. Uh, the industry kind of like polices itself i think i don't think like 
I don't know. I think it depends on your, like, if we're going to use, like, the um, academy, like, correlation, like, how important is the academy to film? Like, it's still going to get made, still going to get put out and produced. So, um, I think it's important news. I think it's important to be talked about and that, that, that uh, Gamma should be, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Trusted and trustworthy and well-run organization. And it's important that people like this kind of step out of that, that light and shine and put that spotlight on the other group. But you also have to take everything with a grain of salt because you're also relying on one person's word over everyone else's at this point in time. Like it'll be more interesting if more people come out and say, you know, I totally agree with what Michael said and I'm on his side and things need to change. And, and I'm glad he said something, but more than likely nothing's going to come out of that side and it's right. just going to move on the way that it has been running. Right, right, right. Yeah. It's been an interesting year too, because, you know, at, was it, it was at Gen Con this last year too. The, you know, the president of Gamma got expelled from Gen Con for, you know, an incident while he was there as well. And I don't really think Gamma ever said much about it. So <laughs> I I think that, yeah, there can be, I think it maybe he is onto something that things aren't functioning there quite as well as they should be, maybe. Yeah. I mean, so. that happens with. Well, it doesn't always happen, but you see it happen in businesses where <clears throat> a whole board is taken over and replaced. And mm -hmm. obviously that's a sign of something not going right and someone saying something to the right person. So maybe this is that first step in that direction. Absolutely. Who knows? Uh, the last board game story of today before we get into video games, <clears throat> Darwin Bromley founder of Mayfair Games, has passed away. So uh, Darwin Bromley, uh, this is also from a Dice Tower News article, um, started as a co-designer of a game called Empire Builder in 1982, um, which was considered one of the first popular route connection games uh, and founded the company to distribute it, Mayfair Games. Uh, most people know Mayfair from uh, Catan or Settlers of Catan before it was brought to the U.S. Uh, Agricola, um, so many games. Uh, and Asmodee bought uh, Mayfair back in 2016, uh, which was the start of Asmodee's huge acquisitions, I would say. Um, and yeah, I mean, he was just a big, important titan in the board gaming industry, the Mount Rushmore, one of the heads on Mount Rushmore of board games of modern day board games, at least so like where we are now, um, you know, he represents a lot of, of where we came from and where we're still going. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Catan did just put out an expansion. Like it's still going. Uh, this is a game that continues to live and, you know, he was a guy that, that brought that to us. So uh, much respect for Darwin Bromley. You have anything to say about Mr. Darwin? I think it's just one of those, you know, want to pay due respects to someone who really, you know, founded a company that has helped shape hobby board gaming to what it is today. I mean, if you look, I'm looking at the Board Game Geek page for Mayfair really quick, and you just look at, like, you know, the first, like, 10 games on the list. Caverna, Lahav, Patchwork, Tigers and Euphrates, Agricola, Grand Astor, Austria Hotel, Steam, Isle of Sky, 1830 Rail Railways, and Robert Barons, and Modern Art. Yeah. Like that is an amazing catalog of games. And that is like the first page sort of by rank. And that doesn't even get into your Catans, your Agricola, some of those huge games that had um, really pushed the limits as too far as bringing games to, to a large group of people. So just, you know, wanted to pay due respects to someone who really had a huge impact on the game industry and really help make hobby board gaming, you know, what they are today. And, you know, Mayfair, a company that, had financial struggles like they closed down and then reopened and then sold themselves to asthma day like did a lot of things to try to keep them going and and still publishing you know high quality hobby board games so uh, much respect to darwin and, and everything he did and and you know may he rest in peace yeah 
All right. Yeah. So that is enough of board game news. Look at this, man. We're crushing it. This is the reason there's no uh, topic this week because it's just going to be a full news day because let me tell you, this video game news is about to get super juicy. So starting with video game <laughs> news, got a couple lighter stories. PlayStation has added another game to cross-play. Rocket League has joined the fray, which means that the PlayStation cross-play beta program now has two games. What's Fortnite, the first one? Fortnite. I thought that wasn't working yet. No, I'm pretty sure it started working the day they announced it. Uh, okay, you might be right. I might be wrong. <laughs> Fortnite and Rocket League. So okay. those are the two games <laughs> in the beta program. I'll double check on that as you answer this next question. Okay, so we have a free-to-play game and a super small, not in a derogatory way, but a smaller a game from a smaller publisher. Obviously, sure. Rocket League has made lots and lots of money. But was offered, you know, free on PlayStation Plus and, and took off huge. So those are the two games, though, that we have both in some ways started from a free-to-play base. Yeah, you have to pay for Plus, but I think that's where, that where they hooked a lot of people into Rocket League and it kind of grew. What do you think, if you were charting the course for PlayStation with crossplay, hmm. clearly they're adding things at a, a pretty slow rate. But yes. what would you, you know, in the next, by the end of 2019... What other games would you like to have C be in the crossplay program? So that's a good question. I think <clears throat> if you look at it from like the financial standpoint where some people were thinking that Sony was coming from, I'm not saying that that's where they were coming from um, for the crossplay issue. Like Sony wants you to play games on the PlayStation, which makes sense. <clears throat> right now, as you're pushing crossplay, you want to start focusing on the games that not a lot of people are playing right now, if that makes sense. So Dead by Daylight, Friday the 13th, these games that are on both consoles that have been free on previous Plus, like PlayStation Plus or Xbox Live Gold that isn't costing so Sony any money. They're just getting extra subscriptions, if that's how they're looking at it. So you, can, you want to start focusing on those first. Um, and then maybe you start building relationships with developers or, you know, other studios to say, okay, this is working the way we want it to work. Like they have to get into the Minecraft game, um, that maybe should probably be next for them. Um, because it's still a huge powerhouse for money and now just Xbox and switch work together on that right now on maybe PC. I, th I think so. And then, I, think, I mean, they also have Minecraft Dungeons coming out this year, so it'll probably be a good thing to get on. Yeah, so there you go. Um, so, yeah, I think, like, games like Friday the 13th and Dead by Daylight, they really stand to benefit from PlayStation and Microsoft being able to play together. Um, so I think those would be huge, even though the, like, uh, Dead by Daylight is arguably a better produced and quality game than Friday the 13th by mm -hmm. every account that I hear of. Um Maybe even games uh, like Evolve, a uh, game that could be resurrected. <laughs> Do you think if Evolve went cross, uh, like that they would did crossplay, that people would go back to playing Evolve? I think so. I think like when it hit Games of Gold, like they saw a huge bump, and then that's when they and that's when they enabled a crossplay with PC, and it got a huge bump on PC. But it was just like a little spike. It didn't really go too far. Is Turtle Rock even doing anything with Evolve anymore? I don't think so. I don't think so either. No, I think Coach Mo would know. He's like the he's like a good he's a good champion for Evolve. He is. Um, I haven't seen much, but it wasn't that long ago, maybe six months six months ago, where they really started a another big push on PC. But I didn't hear much of it after that. Um, but that's what I would say. What do you think for that for that crossplay aspect? So backing up really quick from yes. the PlayStation blog, uh, September twenty sixth. And this is just reading the article that was posted by John Cadera, who's president uh, of Sony Interactive Entertainment. He says the first step will be an open beta beginning today for Fortnite that will allow for cross-play pl platform gameplay progression and commerce across PlayStation 4, Android, iOS, Nintendo Switch, Xbox One, Microsoft Windows, and Mac operating systems. Okay. All right. Because so. I was asking it in Discord last week when we were trying to figure out our game to play, and no mm -hmm. one, no one knew that. No one's. I asked everyone, "Can you play PlayStation and Xbox?" And nobody knew. Yeah. Well, I think part of it probably is because I don't know of many of the people in our circle, at least, that play games on PlayStation. 
I don't know of any of them who really play Fortnite regularly. I don't know that any. I don't know anyone who plays it That's regularly true. anymore. <laughs> but Which I really know, shows like, how out of touch with the general populace <laughs> they are. I know, like um, a lot of us have it on every console, like yeah. Switch, Xbox, PlayStation. A lot of people on there have it. Kevin Austin would be the person I would lean to most on Fortnite knowledge. Right. Yeah. So uh, for me, yeah. Anyway, I don't play Fortnite anymore, but uh, for me, I think staying with probably free to play games is where they're more likely going to say or smaller published titles. So not games from Ubisoft and Activision, even though I think some of those would have some cool options. But I think you're going to see like games like Warframe, games like uh, Paladins, Realm Royale. I think you're going to see games like that will probably be the next slate of games that are going to to go into that direction. And I think it's really going to be helpful for those style of games to do that. Because, you know, if especially if you are playing a game that doesn't cost anything to play, are you really going to buy a PlayStation so to play Warframe with your friend? The answer is 100% no. Right. You know, so it's free. Right, exactly. So I think games like that are going to be fun. I think are are good steps. I think also smaller multiplayer titles, like I think of things like Gang Beasts. Yeah. And things like that, I think could really benefit from something like this where you don't have a huge uh, pool of multiplayer that you would potentially do and being able to play that with friends across platforms, I think would be really helpful. You know, obviously my dream would be Overwatch, but I, I don't see that happening. I don't see, especially when in are still going to be and obviously overwatch doesn't have it but since a lot of the big AAA games have a marketing deal of some sort with either playstation or xbox i think you're less likely to see cross play in those games that have some sort of marketing deal because why would i if i'm paying money to activision for call of duty right and you can get like exclusive stuff you know for a limited time like on our platform yeah we saw that happen with fortnite Right, like, why do I want you playing that game then yeah. with people who don't have those things? So yeah, no Overwatch would be the same. Yep. Yeah, well, I mean, because you have you, they don't want you to like the the Fortnite controversy was like they didn't want you to share V Bucks via console, right? Like PlayStation well, V Bucks were separate from like like Switch. Yeah, but that but the cross progression and cross commerce is now part of all of this. Right. Like so, well, for- like with Sony. So I guess is the question: if you buy Overwatch credits whatever they're called so here here's the the playstation get those or just blizzard get those so here's here's the the rub a little bit if i go into the playstation store and buy loot crates because you can't just buy credit you have to buy loot boxes if i go buy loot boxes on playstation and i open those and i get those earned on playstation so whatever skins i unlock whatever whatever that is on my playstation account however if because like my blizzard account is attached to my twitch my twitch account yeah as is my playstation as is my xbox if i earn something via twitch for overwatch i get that in both games right so that's where i think it is like if so if i get loot boxes i get those in both places if i get them from blizzard themselves but if i go buy the stuff on playstation store that does not transfer to my xbox account right okay at least is how it has seemed from everything i have done so yeah i hear you but yeah so that's what i like i think having things like that would be would be good but we'll see you know there was a long time between the announcements between those first two games hopefully future games get announced a little bit more regularly than you know four months between them (laughs) so moving on some other fun news the uncharted movie gets another director but this Mm -hmm. time it is none other than dan trachtenberg the director of 10 Cloverfield Lane. And if you're a fair listener are not familiar, Dan Trachtenberg actually used to do video games, podcasts, and video shows. Uh, the Totally Rad Show being the probably his most popular one that ran for like five years in the late 09, like the 08, 09, 2010 time. Um, so that was kind of his most popular one. And there's a clip right now floating around on the internet of him being like, oh my gosh, I would love to get the rights to direct Uncharted. But how do you feel, sir, about Dan Trachtenberg directing the Uncharted movie with Tom Holland playing Nathan Drake? Well, do you know the other very famous thing that Dan Trachtenberg is known for? 
uh, he did. Was it the portal short yeah. on YouTube? Portal no escape. So yeah. that was huge. It blew up the internet when you couldn't blow up the internet right. in 2011. That never happened. Um, this was like this portal short came out and he was just like, I want to do video game stuff. Mm -hmm. People are like, why is this guy not doing video game stuff? Let's do it. Um, and then he went and he directed Playtest, which was the video game short on Black Mirror, which was awesome. Yep. Uh, and <laughs> he is directing an episode of the show The Boys, which is based off one of my favorite comic books that's coming to, I want to say, Showtime. I could be wrong. Um, which is a show about um, superheroes who are bad in a group of people who kill superheroes that do terrible things. Oh, to people. I've heard about this. Okay. Uh, so I can't, and it's created by Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg. Uh, I cannot wait for everything that he's already doing. So perfect. I put, bring him on board. Uh, I'm thrilled that he's going to be uh, doing this. I think he's super talented. Um, by all accounts, he's a good writer. Mm -hmm. And it's good to have a good writer as a director, even if they're not writing the film. Absolutely. Because they have good insight. Um, and yeah, he took 10 Cloverfield Lane, a movie that was not a Cloverfield movie when it was being made. Turned that into a Cloverfield film. Probably better than, probably the best Cloverfield film. Um, you no know doubt. he can nail drama. You can mm -hmm. know he can nail dialogue. And that's what Uncharted is going to be mm -hmm. for the most part. That's where... It, where the characters will shine in that obviously it's going to be an action adventure movie, but um, I'm just not sold on Tom Holland, uh, which is fine. He could sell me <laughs> uh, on it. Like he's going to be one of my favorite book uh, adaptations, um, chaos walking. So, um, you know, we'll see what happens, uh, but th this project has been on its own roller coaster ride. So we might have a new director or new lead any t any minute now so that is very true once they start production i'll be more excited for dan trachtenberger to be involved yeah dan I, trachtenberg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're all a little hungry right now it's totally yeah. fine. i think this is a i think i am more excited about the uncharted movie than i ever have been right now as a result of this that i always was kind of in the back of my mind being like okay the uncharted movie is probably never going to happen like they keep attaching people but None of them seem like the absolute best fit. It's fine. Yeah, they're a good director, whatever it might be. But I feel like maybe now we have a director who really wants to make this movie. Like, not just because, oh, I'm going to get paid. Like, someone who this is a movie they have always wanted to make. And for me, if Dan Trachtenberg can't get this ma movie made, I probably <laughs> don't care about this movie anymore because yeah. I don't know, like if whoever, if they bring someone in after, if this doesn't work out, I don't know who that person can be that can possibly make me think that they're going to care about this franchise as much as he does. So I'm excited. I think this is going, this gives this director signing gives the movie the best chance it has of a being made and B when it gets made, not totally sucking. <laughs> <laughs> so that is my thoughts on that okay now time to get into some of the juicier news of the week so bungie has decided to forge their own destiny and they have ended their contract and ties with activision that is right bungie has taken back destiny they will be responsible for publishing destiny moving forward and all of that that entails, it sounds like on PC, it's going to stay on the on Blizznet, it sounds like. So it sounds yeah. like it's going to stay on the Blizzard launcher for now, maybe forever. Who knows? Maybe until there's another version of Destiny. But with that being said, Josh, we have both played Destiny. We have both played mm. Destiny 2. What do we, what do you, as the level of Destiny fan you are, now that Bungie has it back, what do you want to see from Destiny? What'll make you get reinvested and excited? Is this enough to get you reinvested and excited that now, you know, the evil corporation Activision has been <laughs> searched and Bungie is free to do all the awesome things that they want to do? Is Destiny going to be like five times better than it is now in a year? Well, here's the thing, right? So I was really excited, just like the rest of the internet after the news dropped about this. And I think it's good for Bungie for sure. Um, 
I'm a Destiny fan. I still enjoy playing Destiny 2. I still haven't finished Forsaken. Um, I still jump into it every once in a while. Um, actually, I intentionally stepped back from Destiny 2 because of how much time I spent with Destiny 1. Uh, <laughs> as of now, father and uh, husband, I could not put as much time into Destiny 2 as I did into 1. Um, well, I mean, you probably could have. You might just have been... A- a bit neglectful yeah on everything including eating and sleeping <laughs> uh uh my worry came about 24 hours after this announcement when polygon broke article or the article about how we destiny 2 might just end because activision still has a lot of control over destiny 2 and the rumors being that um, there's still two more content drops planned for Destiny 2, and then Bungie might just shut it down. And I ran it by our resident um, Destiny expert dev, and he's like, yeah, I just heard about this, and that's possible. So my worry now isn't about Destiny 2 becoming free for De- Bungie to do whatever they want. My worry now is, are we going to get Destiny 3 already? And they just asked people to pay another 80 plus dollars for Destiny 2 additional content. Everyone thinks Bungie being Bungie now, that they're going to get away from this model. They wouldn't be able to put out a game if they weren't charging for the content they're releasing. It's no different than DLC, pay DLC. What what I think we're going to see is Destiny 3 will come out. It might not even, it probably won't be called Destiny 3. It'll probably be called like Destiny because they're going to, I think they're going to adopt the World of Warcraft or MMO uh, structure where you're paying for content every year or every other year or twice a year, whatever their model is going to be. And they're going to have this main structure of a game, which Destiny, you look at Destiny 1 and Destiny 2, the core gameplay is still the same. It looks prettier. Mm -hmm. Um, There's more content. But if you look at games like Warframe and Fortnite and Overwatch and Paladins, they're able to keep the same structure but make the game look different every update because you can patch that stuff. You can make it graphically better. You can add more content off of one basic game. And I think that that's a smart move for Bungie. I don't, you know, and it all depends on how they decide to handle it um, cost wise, because that's what the big, that's what people are going to complain about. So when you think about the possibility that, you know, they finish these two extra other content drops that they've promised for Destiny 2, and then they're like, okay, we are winding down Destiny 2 because we're going to launch a, we're going to launch the version of Destiny we always wanted to, but we're never able to, you know, a year later. And because I think, an analyst came out and said, we're going to get Destiny 3 in 2020, right? Which means they'd have to be working on it today. <laughs> right, and probably have been. Yeah. If they're like, okay, you know, it's Destiny colon a new beginning or whatever the name of the game is. Right. And Bungie says, hey, you know, those other Destinies were good, but this is the Destiny we always wanted to make. Is that enough to get you to jump in again and you know, if you go the MMO route or the World of Warcraft route, like that's a monthly subscription, right? Is that enough? Do you trust them enough to jump in for that? Not blindly, because they said Destiny Two was the destiny they always wanted to make, and that's not the case. Like they're still saying that, which right. is fine. It's like an it's like an evolving like motto. <laughs> like always, <laughs> we always, this is always the next one will always be the one we want to make. Um, I think. Honestly, we'll never know how much or how little Activision held them back from their vision. Right. um, Because it's always going to be someone's word against someone else's word. I think I've gotten enough enjoyment out of Destiny to invest in the new Destiny the day on day one. I have enough um, history with it. It's, It's if they can keep me because no MMO has been able to keep me. So that's really what it will become. Right. Final question related to destiny before we move on to other exciting interesting news you know activision stocks drop 
like 10% the day after this news was announced. Yeah. People talked about how folks at Bungie were popping champagne and being super stoked about this. Lots of stories going around. And, and one underlying regular thread you heard, I think mostly from fans and people who wanted this to happen specifically on one console, was that, well, it's time for Microsoft to swoop in right. and purchase Bungie to add them to their stable of studios. What do you think the chances of Bungie, whether it be Microsoft or anyone, what do you think the chances are of Bungie aligning themselves with either A, another publisher again, or B, allowing themselves to be fully purchased and become a quote unquote first party studio for someone? Well, look at how badly Bungie wanted to get away from Microsoft. They well, it's a different hell. era. It's a totally <laughs> different era yeah, of Microsoft. That's true. Like, not the same people. But they gave they wanted it away from Microsoft so much that they gave Microsoft the Halo. Like they're like, you just take it so we can go and do our own thing. Right. And they did Destiny, which was great. And now they're like, all right, Activision, do it this time. We're taking our game our game with us. <laughs> um I think I don't know what their mindset is. Would it be better for them financially to go to someone else? Yes. It would. They got a, I mean, they're a huge studio now, and they had yeah. other Activision studios providing support on stuff. Right. It's not just Bungie. Any studio would need help financially, mm. whether it's just from budget, budgetary, or manpower, whatever the case. They would benefit from going to Microsoft or going to Sony. Um, however, maybe they're in a situation where they want to prove that they can do it on their own. Maybe right. they think if we go to Sony, we're losing all of the Xbox sales. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a lot to think about. Um, do I think it's possible we see them sign with someone? Yeah, I think it's totally possible that someone buys them out. Sign I'm talking about like they're like a free agent, they're signing with someone. Um, it's totally possible. It's not it's not something I would be shocked by. Um, but I would say that it's in my head 50 50 odds that they stay by themselves or they sign or they join someone. I, I would be happy either way. I just want them to put out good content. If they just were. Just don't go to EA. Okay. I was going to say, <laughs> if they were to go to somewhere, where would you want them to go? I mean, the selfish part of me want, would want them to go to Microsoft. Um, but considering I played Des I'm playing Destiny 2 on PlayStation right now, like I wouldn't be mm -hmm. mad if they went to Sony. So I would play my Xbox more. <laughs> that I can understand. So I have no idea how accurate this is, but according to a Eurogamer article from 2016, there's approximately 750 people who work at Bungie. Wow. Can you imagine any like and that, again, who knows how accurate that is? Who knows? That could be off by 50 or off by 400. Like, who knows? Right. But that's, as an independent studio, that's got to be scary. That's a lot of people to keep employed. But if you're Microsoft or you're Sony and you're like, all right, we're going to go buy a studio. Do you want to buy a studio with 700 employees? Uh, like, that's a lot of people to have to pay now. Yeah. Well, you know what would happen. I don't know what would happen. Tell me. They would, of course, well, of course, they would want to buy a studio. They would want to buy Bungie, but specifically Bungie. Oh, absolutely. They but they wouldn't keep that staff on. No, absolutely. They wouldn't. That's what People would happen. Would for sure. They would cut that studio in half. And they'd be like, sorry, guys, Santa Monica Studios is now also working with Bungie. Or, sorry, guys. Uh, I should say, Microsoft is like in this weird, like, generosity phase so maybe microsoft would buy them and let them keep their studio mm -hmm. for a little bit but eventually that's a lot of people to keep on staff that is that is, that is huge for a gaming company yeah other interesting side note before we move on uh destiny 2 published mm -hmm. by activision but do you know who published destiny 2 in japan oh yeah it's tencent no or is no is it the other one no who is it sony really Yep, Sony was the publisher of Destiny 2 in Japan. Yep. Sony just, Sony, like, uh, is it SCE? As I, Sony Interactive Entertainment. I'm assuming. Is it the it, Japan one? I'm assuming that it had to do with their publishing, with their marketing deal with 
Activision. I feel like it has to do with that yeah. than it has to do with That's e interesting. But yeah, if you look at the publisher of Destiny 2 in Japan, it's Sony. This it wasn't published on Xbox One in Japan. Well, yeah, because they don't sell Xbox oh, exactly. ones in Japan. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> very, very true. But yeah, so the publisher was actually Sony in, in Japan. But anyway. Nice. All right. So moving on to less exciting news. But this just, is exciting news, I thought. Okay, well, it's exciting, but it's crazy. It, it's a whole bunch of different ones all wrapped into one. So I'm going to let you talk about whichever ones follows your heart. But apparently 2019 started and everyone decided they're going to sue one another. So the actual Pinkertons are suing Rockstar Take Two Interactive for basically, I think they just want some money because they made a whole bunch for using them in Red Dead Redemption 2. Gearbox and their former studio lawyer are suing one another. And it's ugly. And it is very ugly. <laughs> Netflix is being sued by the original publishers of the Choose Your Own Adventure book series because of Bandersnatch. And that's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and the orange shirt kid, who I have no idea who that is. Their mom is suing Fortnite like everyone else because apparently her, the orange shirt kid did a dance that now is an emo in Fortnite, apparently. He, he entered a Fortnite contest to be made a dance character. Oh, really? Is that how? That's even yeah. more stupid. Then. He entered the contest to win. <laughs> to be made into an emote, and now they're suing for money. I'm pretty sure the, the things he signed for the contest probably said you cannot get that it. lawsuit. <laughs> so, anyway, so apparently everyone is suing everyone. That's how we're starting yeah. 2019. Uh, any of these that jump out to you, any of these that you want to talk about, why are we all suing each other? What's going on? <laughs> well, people want money. People have been suing each other <laughs> forever over stupid things. Um, this just happens to be in our industry area. Our right. industry. Like I talk like we are in this industry. In our in our interest uh, area. Uh, from my understanding... Uh, they're suing Bandersnatch because they use the phrase "choose your own adventure," which you don't own a phrase. I'm sorry, you might own books called "choose your own adventure," but you can't sue me for saying "choose your own adventure" to somebody. Can you? You might be able to trademark a phrase. So, like I just said, Kyle, I really this those stupid "choose your own adventure" books. I, I mean, they could potentially <laughs> sue you. I, potentially, yeah, because I think it comes down to like. Well, because I'm trying to think of how it worked for music. Because, like, is it you can? Because I think like you can like copyright lyrics, but you can't copyright titles or something like that. You could technically sing your version of a song, and they can't sue you because it's your version of a song. Yeah, there's something there's something weird with how all so, that works. But yeah, I mean, this is silly. The Netflix thing is silly. Uh, but excuse, oh my gosh, that was rude. <laughs> Oh my god! Uh, you can edit that out. Uh, I'm probably not going to. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't understand that thing. It makes it makes my stomach upset. Um, <laughs> Gearbox. Um, in in this this thing really blew up for me. It like really bugs me. It reminds me of the whole Chris Hardwick thing that happened last year. Where I don't know that you'll ever get 100% the right story from everybody. But um, Randy Pitchford, who runs Gearbox, I'm a big fan of. I've been fortunate, I was fortunate enough to meet him. He was a genuinely nice guy. And then the story comes out, which is horrible, if it's if true, about a potential uh, things that Randy Pitchford was into and getting money. And then, you know, Here's the problem. I think that we're still in this um, uh, fire and pitchfork situation where the second any news story is dropped, everyone rushes to blame or crucify or take down the person that the story is written about or without hearing anything else about what has happened. So immediately... Someone puts out a story, Josh did this. Everyone's like, why would Josh do that? Josh is a terrible person. Josh is evil. Why would he do such a thing? And then I'm like, uh, what's happening? I have a thousand tweets on my phone right now. And then you, everyone does this. And then you go, okay, three hours go by. And then this story comes out. Oh, did you hear about that guy who said those things about Josh? No. Well, what about him? Oh, well, he's a disgraced former employee who embezzled and stole thousands of <laughs> dollars from Josh. Oh, okay. Well, 
does that make him a bad person? He did he lie to us? He's probably still telling the truth. Like, how do you know? Everything is suspect now. So this story came out about Randy Pitchford. It was not a great story. And then you find out the story was released by a former lawyer who supposedly stole lots of money from Gearbox. And his story was using a lot of uh, freely used quotation marks around certain parts of his story to make, uh, as they say, legalese speak sound differently about the suit and what may or may not be true and what may or not be hit, may or may not be his interpretation of certain accusations. So since that story has come out, we have gotten no more clarification on the story. So we don't know what the heck is happening. Um, so I don't know what to say about it. I'm not going to try to sit here and defend Randy Pitchford because I don't know him. He doesn't know me. He, he doesn't need me to defend him. He has lawyers for that. He has a PR team to do that. Um, I just hope that whatever happens in this story, clearly this is the one that bugs me the most out of our <laughs> stories. Um, I just hope it gets resolved. And I hope that, um, because of how quickly this went out to the public, I hope they share with the public the results of what happens so people can kind of move on right and you know we're not legal experts by any means on the show the only thing i know about anything from a legal perspective is that since uh the name of the other employee is wade calendar who is the gearbox lawyer uh for a number of years he was the, their official counsel when a lawyer files a suit because like that's a big thing people are like well when you when you file a lawsuit or when you, when you put any of this stuff in like you can say whatever you want right? right like you can like well that's kind of true for most people but you can't do that when you're a lawyer when you're a right. lawyer you actually have to be more truthful when you submit these sorts of things because it can affect your ability as far as like your buy your bar licensure and things like that if you are blatantly dishonest or misleading when you file suits right so it, I'm, I'm not saying that means that what he said is all completely 100 percent legitimate and i'm sure it was probably very very carefully crafted and worded into how yeah. it was presented and everything that was said but i think it is important to note that when a when a lawyer is going through and them themselves submitting paperwork for these things they do have to um be a bit more discerning and honest than the average citizen would have to be when it comes to this type of paperwork. And there's the end of my knowledge about lawyers. <laughs> yes. I would just add lawyers also aren't supposed to steal money from their clients. So if he was really worried about his lawyer standings. <laughs> well, see, now you are know, saying that thing. he did. Now it's you're saying thing. he did. I know. I'm just saying in the case, if in the case that if this was true, maybe he wouldn't also hold himself to the same standards if that was something that was true. It's true. On it's the other side of the fence. I'm not saying... I see what side you're on. I see what side you're well, on. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I am <laughs> a little on one side over the other. Yes, I um, see that. But yeah, it, it just uh, both sides could be lying. But the point is like, yes, lawyers have to hold themselves to these standards. Also, they're not supposed to do the things this person is accused of doing. Correct. That so, is true. Like Sammy Sosa isn't supposed to cork baseball bats, but <laughs> maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. Well, no, I think it's pretty obvious that yeah, Sammy Sosa cork this baseball bats. Example. <laughs> this is a bad example. You know what I'm trying to say, though, I think. <laughs> that but, is yeah. true. But it, it, that's like not that we're going to go down this rabbit hole, but that then gets into this very interesting um, self-justification of the things that like what is ethical and moral and what is not and maybe you know he felt and again not saying that any of this happened but like if you're, it's easier to justify like oh the company owes me this thing like I have done the work I am right. owed this I deserve this like it's easier for that thought process to go through and allow people to go maybe astray of what they should do rather than breaching though like an ethical code of conduct that they know for their work that is very or their profession that is very clear right yep. you are not supposed to do x sweet i'm not supposed to do that thing but this company i work for i work real hard and i do a lot of things so i think there's definitely 
those things are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Like just because maybe he did embezzle a ton of money from the company, that's very possible. But that doesn't mean then that he all that he is being dishonest about the other thing. Right. So true. That's true. Yeah. Also, yeah. Well, um, we don't have to debate it. We, we know where <laughs> we stand on it. We know where we stand. I think that we probably the truth is somewhere between in the middle of all of that. There's truth in there. The truth is out there, Kyle. It truth is out there, and it's probably. <laughs> Neither one of them is probably 100% correct. It's probably ugly. Yeah. It's probably, I'm sure. I don't want to know it. I'm sure neither, nobody is probably going to come out of that one looking super, super great. Well, so. I mean, of, uh, the, Randy Bitchford had an interview that it was pu- made public that. Well, it was on a podcast. Yeah. It <laughs> sounded mean, like, like people were like, what he said was not, depending on where you are and what your thoughts are, maybe you think they're not. They're disgusting, but they're not illegal. <laughs> right. There's a big difference between what he's being accused of and what he's saying that he did. Gotcha. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> right. Okay. And one other thing I just want to point out before we move on to the last story, uh, I did a little bit of reading about Orange Shirt Kid because this is <laughs> yeah. what I thought had happened. So I was very confused. So he had submitted the dance as part of Epic's Boogie Down contest, but did not win the contest. Oh. Uh. So a wave of support and a petition led the developer to include it in the game anyway. So he did not win, but I have to imagine that even submitting the dance. Yeah, it's like if you enter a sweepstakes, every, right. all that fine prints like you right. entered. We have yeah. your name. <laughs> so and it says from the outset, the boogie down contest made clear that entrants waived rights and wouldn't be paid. OK, there so go. there you go. So I don't I don't think boogie down kid is going to win. Sorry, orange shirt kids mom i don't think that's gonna work out for you but you know what i've been wrong before we all have we all have (laughs) and finally news that broke this evening just prior to us recording you know number one video games journalist jason schreier reporting that ea has canceled their open world star wars game so you might be aware that back in the day Uh, there was a Star Wars game being worked on at Visceral. And that game was the eight quote unquote, Amy Henning Star Wars game. EA closed Visceral because, you know, apparently that game wasn't turning out the way they wanted to and took that project and moved it to EA motive. Uh, EA motive said they were going to take the assets of that game and use it to change the pivot direction and make it into this open world game that was going to have more basically they wanted to make it so that players were going to be able to play the game for longer and there was more ways to interact so that happened ea motive eventually opened a vancouver office and then eventually i think Van- ea vancouver and ea motive merged into one office and that's when jade raymond left and now apparently ea is just not happy with that game that started all of those years ago and has canned it so back in 2013 EA signed the exclusive rights to make uh, Star Wars games. And from that time, we have gotten Star Wars Battlefront and Star Wars <laughs> Battlefront 2. Now, Star Wars... use of a license. <laughs> yeah, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order uh, is supposed to come out from Respawn this year still, fall of 2019, uh, being directed by the person who directed God of War 3. So kind of a action combat game, which I'm actually very excited for because uh, I liked God of War 3. So... Josh, what are your feelings on this game getting canceled? There are cries abound on the internet to for Disney to figure out a way to pull the li- EA li- the Star Wars license from EA. Do you agree with those calls? And what do you what what's next? What's next as far as for EA and Star Wars games outside of you know Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order? Well, least surprising news of the year, and I'll say that I think everyone thought this was going to happen. And just everyone's disappointed that it did happen. I bet you Activision was like, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. uh, also, uh, I guess, fun fact, there have been more new Star Wars movies than Star Wars games from EA since they acquired the license. That's pretty bad. Um, <laughs> they could have at least been putting out crappy licensed movie games. <laughs> I guess they don't like money like Activision and Bungie do. Um, This whole Star Wars licensing just is mind-boggling to me. 
that the only games we get from EA are terrible Star Wars games where everyone, like, you could see where there's a good game in these games. Like, we, Battlefront 2 was supposed to fix all of our issues, and then it just got slammed to this terrible microtransaction nonsense that everyone was afraid of. And instead of EA, like, slowing down, they just kind of push for more into it. Like, let's see how much the community will take. And we'll take three months off from microtransactions and bring them right back. Uh, I don't, do you know how long the license is that they have? It was a 10 year deal, I believe. Okay. So there's, oh boy. And they got it in 2013. So, You're so just our Discord. Your our Discord chat today was like, Disney doesn't care about video games. Well, I didn't jump in to this conversation because whether that statement is true or not, it's it's wrong. Disney cares about money. They're a business. They're a successful <laughs> business, which means Disney cares about video games because video games are a huge business. So in a roundabout way, Disney cares about Star Wars video games. Mm-hmm. Whether they do directly or indirectly, it is important to them because it also represents their brand. It, whether you can tie Battlefront 2 to a Star Wars movie or not, it still represents the Star Wars brand. Right. And if you have a bad product out for your brand, you don't want that out there. Right. You don't want everything representing you to be quality. So is there a way for Disney to buy the license back from EA or renege on the contract or buy out early or whatever the case, should they do that? Yeah, they should do that because EA has not shown to them that they can make anything in six years that is profitable to Disney or, okay. or sheds positive light on their brand. So I'm going to read now an update to the story. From Jason Schreier that happened at 10 17 p.m. So this is like 20 oh, minutes ago from when we were recording. Re- <laughs> yeah, while we're recording. So here's his update. This is on Kotaku.com. So go ahead, go feel free to read this yourself. I want to cite, you know, where we're getting this from. But uh Jason Schreier says, since the publication of this article, I talked to several more people familiar with EA Vancouver's now canceled open world Star Wars game. This project was codenamed Orca, was very early in development, but would have involved playing as a scoundrel or bounty hunter who could explore various open world planets and work with different factions across the star Wars universe. When EA's top decision makers looked at the roadmap for the next few years, they decided they needed something earlier than the planned release date for Orca, according to two people familiar with what happened. So they canceled Orca in favor of a smaller scale star Wars project. That's now aimed for much sooner, likely late 2020. And, and to EA's credit, those people said the publisher did not lay anyone off as part of this transition. So it looks like maybe EA is hearing what everyone else is saying and is like, hey, we need games sooner, not later. And that if we have the respawn game in twenty fall of 2019 and we have this other game in fall of 2020, that's a Star Wars game each fall for the next two years. That seems pretty good, doesn't it? They're going to release their last Star Wars game on the dawn of new console generation? No. 2020 is too late. But maybe it's going to be like, you know, the Assassin's Creed Black Flag. Uh, Alexa is telling me basketball stores, scores right now for some reason. Oh, well. Are How you... did this happen? <laughs> oh, uh, gosh. Okay. Alexa really wanted uh, you to know what's going on in the world really, of the NBA. Really threw me for a loop. I, I don't... I, when, when we saw Respawn, do you remember seeing... Was it during... Ubisoft's presentation. It was, it was EA Play last year, like Did sitting in the crowd. That? What's that? Did you have a lot of confidence with that thing that there's going to be a game this year? I mean, they seem pretty confident about it. To release a title. They're like, we have a title. No pictures, no screenshots. Yeah, we haven't seen anything from it yet. <laughs> but hey, I mean, in fairness, now maybe this isn't the best example. Well, excuse me. Um, probably not the, I know. <laughs> probably not the best example, but. Bethesda announced his games at EA at you know E3, where we haven't seen anything of them yet, and then still yeah. releases them the same year. So why can and, you know sometimes they're good, maybe sometimes they're not so good, but why can't EA do the same thing? Like we know the title, why can't they reveal it at EA Play this year, have it come out this fall, and have it still be good? They totally could. I think just Bethesda has a track record in the past few years of actually releasing games very quickly from right. their announcements. So we are 
maybe put a little bit more faith in them. Mm -hmm. I don't know where the faith is in EA right now with Star Wars titles. I mean, you were pretty excited that you get to play the Anthem beta. So I thought you'd have some goodwill for EA. (laughs) Well, I am excited I get to play the Anthem beta early enough to know if I'm going to buy the game or not. (laughs) Gotcha. (laughs) So do you think, though, like I said, now it seems like, you know, they want to have something done sooner. Doesn't that mean that they're listening, that they're hearing what people are saying, that they're not doing enough with the license, that they need to get games out faster? And that for them, they recognize that in order for us to do that, maybe it has to be a bit less ambitious. Isn't that a good thing? Doesn't it show that they're listening? I mean, maybe. Do, Do we want games put out fast, though? I mean, that's what everyone's talking about is that we haven't got enough games. So, well, they aren't saying fast though. EA said the license for six years. People are saying they want Star Wars games from EA, and there's only been two Battlefront games mm-hmm. when they've had the license for six years. They put out a game and then a a game with a new skin on it that was the same game as the first one. Right, but I mean, I, I look at something like God of War. Right, how long did God of How long was God of War in development? Yeah, but, God, but look six, at the quality of God of War in right. the license. R- but I'm saying is, you know, God of War, that game was in development for about six years. Do you want, you know, over so over the course of a of a 10-year contract, if you're looking for games of that quality, how can you expect to get more than two? Uh, that's a fair point, but there weren't three different studios working on three different God of War games. There was one studio working on one God of War game. And I mean, there were three different studios working on three different Star Wars games, and two of them got canceled. Yeah, I mean, I guess you know, would you rather have if the game wasn't going to be good, should they release it anyway? What, what's well, worse we for don't the brand? Know. We don't know what those games were, and everything we saw from thirteen thirteen was supposedly excellent. <laughs> I mean, I supposedly guess. we we yeah. don't know. We don't know? know. We don't know. So I don't know that it's fair to compare God of War to these Star Wars titles, though, because God of War is a pedigree and. And it, we know, like, you, while this God of War was very much different in some aspects from the original ones, it was still a God of War game. Right. Like, we don't know what we're missing. So we could speculate on all, all, all sides of the EA games getting shut down. But I don't know that I would argue that this is a huge... um let down for any Star Wars fan that was waiting for this game. Right. I mean, maybe a better app comparison would be a game like Days Gone, right? Uh, Sony Bend, small studio, not very big at all. I think under 100 people, I think in the 60 to 80 range, has haven't released a game since 2012. You know, releasing this big open world game that is sto- single player story driven, no multiplayer in it. You know, how long is it reasonable for EA to invest or any company to invest in a studio where they turn out one game every six years. You know, I feel like that's probably a more apt comparison, like how, you know, so if you have three studios doing that, then you're going to get five games total, you know, in the 10 years. Yeah. But this, this game is like if Days Gone was in development for six years and then they canceled it, they're like, Oh, okay. (laughs) We're not going to do it now because like, we don't like, we don't know. Obviously, I can't say obviously. I'm thinking EA has made a, a business decision that yes, no one could find anything redeeming in this game because well, otherwise they would have just released it. I mean, we imagine don't necessarily money, know that. Imagine, well, no, I'm assuming, I'm guessing. Right. I don't know that for sure. That's why I said I don't know this. Right. But imagine the amount of money they put into the game mm-hmm. and the development and yep. how many years they've been doing it and the people yep. they've been paying. They're like... I don't know that they were in a spot where they must have had a game that they could have just said, if we put in another six months, we can put this game out. Right. And maybe that wouldn't have been the best decision, but now we wait another two years and they rush out a Star Wars game. Yeah. I mean, for I just kind of feel bad for EA, which is weird to say, because like if they lo- really looked at the game, you know, going back to the visceral game and they were like, this is just not going to work. So what Look is out. worse? What is worse for them as a company to cut their losses and cancel it? Granted, they shut down the studio, which is really tough. You know, obviously right. that's bad. But what's better for them is to is it better for them to cancel a game that isn't living up to the standards or or, or they don't think it's going to meet expectations, or is it better for them as a company to release a game and have people say this is crap? Right. They're kind of damned if they do, damned if they don't. Right. Like if things aren't turning out. They're kind of like nobody's going to be happy with whatever decision they make. I hear you. I mean, they also did look how quickly they made a story for Battlefront 2. 
Yeah, and you remember you played it. Yeah, but it, it it's it has some redeeming quality. I it's mean, not the worst. It's not the worst thing I played. <laughs> Again, really good bar there. It's not the worst. Thing. It's not the it's not the worst story in a game I've ever seen. But I mean, they said that they couldn't do a story in Battlefront One because, well, they didn't. No one wanted a campaign, right? First of all, and then they didn't want to dedicate the resources to it, and then right. they they rush out a campaign in a year for Battlefront Two. And I don't think people overall were very thrilled with it. No, but I i mean, you could talk to people. There's definitely people there that enjoyed it. I mean, I guess my point would be if they have this game that they just canceled that had even a remote amount of that story in it, why wouldn't they just release it? But uh, that's not an answer we'll ever get. That is not, well, maybe well, someday. A documentary someday. Yeah, maybe someday <laughs> no clip will go on. And, and I'm just and disappointed. And while I say it's not totally fair. news, I'm disappointed that that this license has been mishandled regardless of of uh, yes. w- the turnaround time on games or how long games take to get developed. We should have seen, maybe I shouldn't say more games, but we should have seen something else besides Battlefront 1 and 2. Well, and maybe this, you know, the game from Respawn will come out this fall and it'll be amazing and all will be forgiven. I hope so. I hope so too. So, all right. Well, that is it for all of the news. And like I said, whew, that was a whole bunch to get through, but we still do have a few listener questions and we want to make sure we give some time for those. So Josh, why don't you take us through the questions from our wonderful listeners? Well, let's start with what I would argue the ballsiest question with Splig at the delicious legitimately just tagging the president in a tweet to us, which really worried me for about a minute. <laughs> So he says, President at real Donald Trump invited you to the White House to play a game. Knowing the government is shut down, what are you hoping he really splurged on and bought you for dinner? Now, the obvious jokes are just the low-hanging fruit I won't take. Just go on the internet, you'll find it. I, I, I think I would pull Tom Brady, my local football hero, and just, I wouldn't go to the White House. <laughs> I would say I don't want to (laughs) go. Right, because you're going to be hanging out with Donald Trump on your own private time if you're Tom Brady. Well, that's never been proven. There's no pictures of them (laughs) together. (laughs) Uh, I wouldn't go. I would would abstain from – I would say thank you for the invite, but I'm good. (laughs) Okay. So now that we've established you're not going to go, if – you were going to go and get food what kind of food you what what food would you want though i would want a dinner at the white house i wouldn't want mcdonald's big macs i can get that right now okay i could literally leave my house at midnight right now and go get a big mac okay i don't want to go to the white house and get a big mac okay that makes sense (laughs) that's that's fair that's totally fair uh i'm gonna this this question this answer is for dev uh i'm totally 100 asking for chipotle there you go (laughs) i want some chipotle because I can't go outside Trump Chipotle. Tower Taco Bowls instead. Uh, no, <laughs> I prefer Chipotle. Thank you. So, yep, that is what I want. I want me some Chipotle because I cannot just go outside and get it. And even though Dev says it tastes like wet cardboard, I need to <laughs> eat far more wet cardboard then because, man, uh, I do love me some Chipotle. Thanks, Blake, for bringing, bringing politics into board of video games. <laughs> uh, all right. Heavy Metal Riff, a.k.a. Lucas, uh, via Discord. He says, what are some innovations in board games you've seen lately that improve on board games? That's question one. Are there innovations you've yet to see that you wished were implemented? That's question two. And are there any problems in board games that you know need innovating, <clears throat> even if you don't know the, what the answer might be? I don't know how to answer that last one. Um, I think we talked earlier um, about some innovations in board games um that we've seen lately that improve on board games and while i <clears throat> did express my worry for app driven games mm-hmm. i i can't deny that they are improving board games um for the ones they have been implemented in um so i would say um the uh digital app integrations are something i think are improving board games I think for me, the things that I'm seeing that are improving board games are the things that are removing the pain points of playing board games. And for me, that's learning how to play them. And when you have video like folks over at Watch It Played and when you have, you know, Geek and Sundry and all those people who are creating these videos that teach you how to play the games and the games that are going so far as 
hey, there's a rule book, but just start doing this thing. And like it literally walks you through exactly what you need to do. I think for me, like from mechanics aside, everything else, the folks who are making getting into the game easier, that to me is the most important innovation that we see going on right now. Cool. Um, so this next question was, are there innovations you've yet to see you wish or implemented? I'm going to steal your answer um, and kind of cheat on his because the way that Fog of Love was done, the mm-hmm. tutorial, I think it was incredible. So I want to say I wish I wish they implemented that more into games to kind of answer his question um, and kind of st- and steal off yours because I would love for more games to have rule books for reference but like you said just be able to open up a game and get started whereas in like fog of love had you playing the game and directly implemented the rules into the gameplay so it kind of takes what you described mm-hmm. and what like a new innovation and kind of merges them together so i would like to see more games do something like that very cool for me i think the thing that jumps to my mind again all about again trying to remove those pain points uh i want a game that tells me that simplifies or streamlines somehow takes care of game storage well how do i take put the game away how do i get it back out again and set it up because yep. we have so many inserts and things like that which i get they're expensive and it drives the price of games up and we constantly talk about how expensive games are anyway but inserts that make playing the game the act of setting up the game or taking down the game way less i don't want to say stressful but more intuitive than they are like give me direction give me a map in the instruction book that tells me where everything is supposed to go when you give me an insert don't make me guess and try to figure it out and just an empty box full of bags i hate that i just drives me nuts i really would love to have better more thoughtful created inserts that make the act of setting up the game and tearing down the game take less time be less fiddly and figure out a better way to do that. Because I think, you know, you have these companies out there like Broken Token and things like that selling awesome, awesome inserts. But darn it, are they expensive? And I think we can do a better job with game inserts. So, yeah. Okay, cool. And then his last one is, uh, are there any problems in board games that you know need innovating, even if you don't know what the answer might be? So I would say, um, I don't have a good answer for this, but what I would say is I think we need some... Uh, innovation, and I know they've been trying it with um, these classic board games like Monopoly, um, the Game of Life. We need these games to be more accessible to kids like it was for us when we were kids to get children back into the board game hobby. So I would say maybe we need some more innovating into like the Monopoly and the entry-level board games. Awesome. Mine is something I don't know if I have a great way to fix it or a great way to innovate on it, but I think it's one of the biggest issues in board games and one of the reasons that people sometimes don't want to play board games, and that is analysis paralysis. Or when you're playing with folks who take a really long time to decide what they need to do or what they're going to do on their turn. And this often happens, you know, in your heavier Euro games. But there are some games out there that are not a heavy Euro that are supposed to be played at a bit of a quicker pace that making decisions is just hard for people. And one could argue that that is just a personal thing that some people are just always going to have that indecisiveness, that indecision, that inability to decide what they want to do and what's going to be best for them to do moving forward. But I think that there are some games that have done a really excellent job of streamlining or of thinking about how turns progress that help reduce that. And simple things that make it challenging are games that are like, hey, you know, Carcassonne, you draw the tile at the beginning of your turn. Well, you're like, all right, well, now I drew this tile. Now I got to figure out what I want to do with these tiles. So implementing the idea of like, no, you draw your next tile after your turn is over. So you have the entire next time that while things are going around for you to think about how you do that. Or games that have allow you to act at the same time. So multiple players are doing something all at the same time, I think is really helpful in those situations. So anything that can be done or more innovations that can happen to reduce ideally analysis paralysis, or if people have it, other players are active during those times. So it's not, you know, you start getting into the three, four, 
five, six minute turns. And I really want to pick up my cell phone because I'm like, I know exactly what I'm going to do in two turns. <laughs> I really wish you decide what you're going to do. So any designers who can tackle analysis paralysis and kind of innovate that and innovate some mechanics into their games. I'm all for it. I think that's something we need to look at more. Nice. I agree. Less cell phone time. So let's streamline that. Uh, our last question from Elium85 uh, through a Discord. Uh, if you're not in a Discord, what are you waiting for? Come on. We need some good board game talk. Most of it is just video game stuff in there. I know. Um, he asks, how much app slash digital integration can a game have and still be a board game? Um, and I think that's that's a good question because we're kind of, I think, approaching that uh, part of board games now is what is a board game? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's getting blurrier with, with all the digital stuff. And like we talk about drop mix right. as being one of those games. Um, so I would ask you, so like this question to me, like kind of directly like hits drop mix, like on the head, like this whole thing that drop mix is, and you take, th- take like drop mix and compare it to, it's not fair to compare it to like mansions of madness, uh, second edition, because one's a music game and one's a, <laughs> a survival horror game. Right. Um, but John Mix doesn't have a board, uh, but it has a deck that you build. So it's a deck building game. I mean, it kind of uh, has a board because it has the the center part that you lay everything on. Oh, okay, yeah. So technically, I guess it does have a, a, a digital board. Well, not digital board. It's a physical board. Um, it feels more like... Um, it, feels more like a peri- it feels more like a peripheral. Peripheral, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know that there's a... <clears throat> that I've seen a board game yet that has like that blend of both yet. So like maybe um, Detective or like Chronicles of Crime, mm-hmm. maybe games like that where they're like right on the line. Right. But I don't know that we'll ever like, as long as it still has cards, a physical board, pawns, pieces, I think it's still considered a board game. And that's kind uh, of where I'm at too, is like, there are definitely games that are apps and, you know, the entire thing happens in the app. But if you're still putting a board on the table, if you're still playing with cards, if you're still using a pawn or other items that you're physically manipulating on the table, to me, I still feel like in a lot of ways, that's still just a board game. Like, yes, there is some technology integrated into it, but they've even had that for like war games and things like that, where there are items of like measuring how far pieces are apart and they can sense where they are on the table and all that good stuff. Like, isn't that still a miniatures game? Like, even though it's using a ton of technology to streamline things, you don't have to measure, you don't have to do things. So for me, you know, if you're still using a board and you're still doing all that stuff, to me, it's still a board game. And I don't think we've quite gotten to the point yet. Because even, you know, like the Lord of the Rings game we talked about, that's still very much a board game. Like, yes, you have an app that's like driving the different missions that you go on, but you still need the board. Like, you still have to have that. Could they put it all in an app? Sure, they could, but they didn't, you know? So... I think anything could just about anything could be totally put into an app and then it's no longer a board game. But if they're still choosing to do that stuff, yeah, I, it's still totally a board game. Like Tabletop Simulator or Tabletopia, I think right. those represent board games, but those are not board games. Correct. You know, then depending, well, and this is where it gets a little bit gray, maybe still, because in some of those, you know, they don't know the rules. So yeah. you still have to play it by the rules. It's still up to you. There's no AI. Yeah, which is interesting, which is an interesting thing to right. have to deal with. Yeah, that's where I think it gets a lot more gray. That's yeah. where I think it gets a lot more gray. But if we're just talking about apps, I think, yeah, as long as we're still using a board. So, all right. Well, thank you, everyone, for your questions. We love when you um, throw them out to us because we want to talk about what you want to hear about. So we are going to go ahead and wrap this show up. But, of course, we want to live leave you with a recommendation to live a well-rounded life. Obviously, we're a gaming podcast, but we do a lot of other things as well. So we're going to give you a recommendation and suggestion, something else that we're doing that we think you might enjoy to help w- live that well-rounded life. Josh, sir, what recommendation do you have for the fine listener? I'm going to change mine. <laughs> I, Interesting. I, I, I actually really, I'm interested in the one you wrote down. So okay. I'm even more interested to see what you're, when you're changing it to, because you can use this one next week. That's fine. Well, I'll tell. I'm, I'll say what it was. I was going to put Bird Box originally. Um, oh, okay. Because people were kind of like people were kind of down on that, and I actually really enjoyed it. Um, I have listed The Innocent Man, which is a documentary on Netflix. Um, I'll talk about it. I'll talk about my thing next week then that I was going to change it to. Um, it's 
I don't know how many episodes it is. It's an hour episode, uh, each episode. It's a docu-series, I'll call it. Um, and there's partial reenactments, but just for um, like establishing shots, there's not really like, it's not like watching like Lifetime or like these channels where people are acting out what happened. Um, it's about a uh, two murders of two girls that lived um, a couple of blocks away from each other in this town in the 80s. <clears throat> And these guys, 70s, 70s or 80s. Um, I'll tell you this. I started watching the first episode. I'm like, this is called The Innocent Man. Okay, so I kind of have something to go off of. Right. Watch the first episode. First episode ends. I'm like, okay, interesting. Everything seems pretty cut and dry. I'm like, maybe episode two will explain it. I watch episode two. I'm like, where's the innocent man? <laughs> this person is guilty. <laughs> And then I want to say like episode three or episode four at the end was a, a twist uh, uh, that changed things. I'm like, okay, maybe the title of this is getting to make a little bit more sense. Um, but right now I'm questioning what the term innocent man could mean, because I feel like this person may not be as innocent as the title represents. <laughs> you might be innocent of one thing, but you might not be innocent. So we'll see where it goes. Uh, it's it's an interesting documentary. Um, it's a very well produced. Uh, you really get a, a good sense of every person's involvement, like bystanders, people who are affected by what happened. Um, uh, it's not for kids. There's actual crime scene photos. Mm -hmm. uh, like right away that they just kind of show it, show you, they don't prepare you. Um, so there's some, some tough images and um, you kind of get to see what the, what the law enforcement is like. And I would argue is a small town, uh, small town ish. And it's not quite making a murder levels, but um, I think it's a little bit better than making a murder. Um, okay. I think the story is more engaging. Mm. Um, but it's also terrifying and it's, it's tough content to deal with. So, right. um, if you're into crime stuff like true crime uh, and stuff like that, check it out. Um, so far I'm enjoying it. Have I'm you finished it yet or no? No, I'm, I, I don't know how many episodes are out. It's a six think, part series. Okay. So I'm almost done. I think I'm like four okay. episode four. Gotcha. <clears throat> yeah. So, it, is in, it is in my queue to watch. I am very interested to to watch this one. Yeah. Check it out. I would say. Um, if it's something you can handle, like right now, maybe I should have waited oh, like a couple of weeks in my life till I was <laughs> in a better situation to watch something like this. But I'm just taking it all in, <laughs> enjoying my time with it. <laughs> uh, I like yours, though. So why don't you okay. give us yours? So, yes, mine is it's time. Actually, if you haven't started already, you're going to be <laughs> watching a lot. Yeah. But it is time to rewatch Game of Thrones, everyone. Yes. The final season premieres April 14th. I think at this point from when we record, you'd have to watch an episode every weekday between now and when it premieres. Well, that's easy. I could watch four episodes in a day. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot how many episodes there are. There's 67 There's episodes. Yeah. Which I, for whatever reason, in my mind, did not remember it being that many. But there's like a lot 11, of episodes. 11 a season, something like that. Oh, yeah. So there's a lot to watch. But yeah, re time to rewatch Game of Thrones. I tried to convince my wife to do it, and she wanted to start an episode or in season three because she thinks episode season one and two are really boring. Oh, they're so good. I know, and I'm like, season one's like one of my favorite seasons. <laughs> you can't appreciate Joffrey in season three if you don't know him in season one. Well, and two. but she already knows him, so she's like, whatever. Yeah, but you got to relive it. <laughs> I know. So if, yes, Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones hype. Thrones hype is real. I'm super excited for this final season uh, to see how they are going to wrap things up. So, hey, rewatch that. Relive some awesome, awesome moments. And Josh, what do you say we wrap this show up? I say yes. <laughs> then you should Thanks. do that. <laughs> yeah, I think I might. I think I might do that. <clears throat> In my head, there's always room for another quippy line, but they're usually never good. So I have to like think it out. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Remember, you can find us on social media at Board with VG, and make sure you use that hashtag, hashtag Board with VG, or on Facebook.com slash Board with VG, and the slightly full Board with VG at gmail.com. Thanks for sending. We got we already got some of your meta spring um, 
submissions and we're getting these fun emails from publishers and we get that fan fiction on the way. I just know it's coming. You can find me on Xbox and Epic Games and Ubisoft and PlayStation. <laughs> uh, why so serious? That's S I R R I U S. Uh, yeah, baloney underscore baloney on Instagram. <clears throat> but there's just pictures of my kid and and escape rooms on there, so you can uh, you can check it out if you want. But you can stick to uh, our board at the Fiji on Instagram for board game pictures. Kyle, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, PlayStation Network, Xbox Live, Board Game Geek, all at Psychocross, C Y C O C R O S S. As always, if you have suggestions for future topics, be sure to reach out to us on the social media because we want to talk about what you want to hear about. Please, please, please send those um, submissions for Meta Spring, board with VG at gmail.com by Friday, January 18th at midnight Eastern time to be entered to win. The more people. We have a we have a good little stream of them going right now, but we'd obviously love more of them. So please send your submissions there. And finally, everyone, whether it be board games or video games, never stop gaming.